Um, I want to tell you about a man named uh, Hiro Onada. Hiro Onada was 20 years old when he was called up to join in the Japanese army uh, back in like 1942. Okay, he was trained as an officer and taught to gather intelligence and how to conduct guerrilla, guerrilla warfare. On December 17th, 1944, Lieutenant Hiro Onada uh, left for the Philippines. He was assigned to the island of Lubang, um, but as you might know if you remember your history, pretty shortly after that, the island was overrun uh, by the Allies. And so... Uh, they were actually knew that it was coming, and they were preparing to escape is what they ended up doing. Um, but as they were coming on and, and the Japanese were trying to escape the island, they left men on the island to conduct guerrilla warfare. And so uh, Onada's major, his commander, the division commander, Major Yoshimi, uh, boy, this is hard, uh, Tanaguchi, gave him these orders. He said, you are absolutely forbidden to die by your own hand. It may take three years, it may take five, but whatever happens, we'll come back for you. Until then, so long as you have one soldier, you are to continue to lead him. You may have to live on coconuts. If that's the case, you live on coconuts, but under no circumstance are you to give up your life voluntarily. So the allies overran the island, um, uh, cells were kind of, um, you know, these men were, ended up splitting into cells, and so uh, Onada had three men under his command. There were four people in his cell. Uh, Corporal Shimada, Private Kon- Kozat Kazuka, Private Akutsu, and then himself. All right, four of them, four of them. As you might know, the war ended on August 15th, 1945, but they didn't know it. Matter of fact, they, first, they got the first leaflet that the war was over in October of 1945. And then for a while after that, leaflet after leaflet would be dropped, newspapers would be left. Eventually, they even had photographs and letters from relatives that were dropped, friends and relatives they brought in to speak over loudspeakers. Uh, There was always something suspicious about it to them, and so they never believed that the the war had actually ended. And so they continued on. 1949, Akatsu wanted to surrender, and so he didn't tell any of the others. He just walked away, and six months later, May 7th, uh, six months later, he was uh, found uh, by the allies or by the, the, the locals. Shimada was killed in a skirmish on May 7th, 1954. And then for nearly 20 years after that, Kozuka and Onada continued to live in the jungle together, continued to take care of their weapon, continued to live on where they were, uh, and different things would happen, but they would always be suspicious. They were always wondering why they were being sought after and all of that. In October of 1972, at the age of 51 and after 27 years of hiding, Kazuka was killed in a clash with, the Filipino per- with a Filipino parole. And though Onada had been officially declared dead in 1959... Kazuka's body kind of gave maybe a hint that maybe Onada was still alive and living out there. So search parties were sent out to find him, but none were successful. Two years later, in 1974, a college dropout named Norio Suzuki decided to travel to the Philippines and a bunch of other countries. He told his friends that he was going to search for Lieutenant Onada, a panda, and the abominable snowman. But, so he, 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 uh, he did what others couldn't, and he actually found Lieutenant Onada. He explained to him that the war was over, and that if he would only surrender, everything, you know, if he would come in, everything would be fine. And Onada said he would never surrender unless his commanding officer came back and gave him the order to do so. And so Suzuki traveled back to Japan uh, and found his commander. 
you know, they told the Japanese government, the government searched, they found uh, the commander major Takaguchi, who had become a bookseller at that point, and on March 9th, 1974, Suzuki and Taguchi met Onada at a pre-appointed place, and the major, or the once major, read the order that stated that all combat activities had ceased in 1945. Onada was shocked at first, and at first, I should say, disbelieving. It, it took some time to sink in. In a, in a book he wrote, he said this. He said, you know, when, when he was told of, the, of that, he said, we really lost the war? You know, this is what he was thinking when he was told. How could they have been so sloppy? Suddenly, everything went black. A storm raged inside of me. I felt like a fool for having been so tense and cautious on the way here. Worse than that, what had, I, what had I been doing all these years? Gradually, he said, the storm subsided, and for the first time, I really understood my 30 years as a guerrilla fighter for the Japanese army were abruptly finished. That was the end. I pulled back the bolt on my rifle and unloaded the bullets. I eased, the pack, I eased off the pack that I had always carried and laid the gun on top of it. He said, would I really have no more use for this rifle that I had polished and cared for like a baby all these years? They said when they discovered him, the rifle was like brand new. He had taken care of it so well. Or he, had, or he said, would I have no use of that? Would I have no use of Kazuka's rifle, which I had hidden in a crevice of rocks? Had the war really ended 30 years ago? And if it had, what did Shimada and Kazuka die for? If what was happening was true, wouldn't I have been better that I died with them? He was the, actually next the last Japanese soldier. Uh, he was the, full, the last full-blooded Japanese soldier to surrender. Um, another one was found in December of 1974. Can you imagine 30 years living in war when you're not at war? Um, it's interesting, and I say that because as we come to the end of of, of uh, 2023, can you believe 2023 is over, and we come to the year of 2024 next year, where are you at in life? Where are you at? And so many of us are in places where we're really still fighting in wars that are over and, and haven't been here. And so... New Year's are great. New Year's are great because they're good times to hit reset buttons. They're good times to say, okay, you know what? 2023 is over, and it's over, and, and, and it's over. I don't, I don't have to do 2023 again. For some of you, that might be disappointing. You'd love to do it over. For some of you, it's like good riddance, right? Thank God 2023 is over. Let's find something new and better in 2024. Um, and I'm going to tell you, as we enter into 2024, what are you looking for? What do you, what do you, what do you, what do you want? Michelle talked about, you know, we, we have these New Year's resolutions, which most of us don't carry out. We're, you know, we're good for like three days and we're done, right? Most of them have to do with weight loss, or maybe you want to read the Bible more, or maybe you want to pray more, or maybe you want to do something, I don't know. Spend more time with family, those kind of things. I don't, I don't know what you want to do, right? But a lot of times they're about getting better or doing something more. Um, and yet, we're still trapped and we're still caught in things that we shouldn't be trapped or caught in anymore. And I think for a lot of us, even as believers in Jesus Christ, we're still mulling through the past and, and too often, we're captured by it, and we let the past define us about who we are. But I'm going to tell you, that's not who you are in Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. And if you're looking for an ultimate blessing, the ultimate blessing in life, the ultimate blessing in life is living out in the forgiveness of your sins. The ultimate blessing for 2024 will be for you to live in the forgiveness of your sins. 
And so today, that's what I want to look at. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. Um, You know, I make that statement that the ultimate blessing in life is living in the forgiveness of your sins. And nobody knew that more than David. Nobody knew that more than David. David was the king of Israel, and yet David had sinned mightily. Um, He had been captured, as a matter of fact, so much by the flesh that he had committed adultery with with a married woman. And then, and then to cover it up because she gets pregnant, he has, him, he has her husband killed in battle, intentionally. And then he lives in that, and in that, in that guilt. And sometimes the guilt isn't even there at first. Um, but when he finally comes to his senses, when Nathan approaches him and can... And, and, and challenges him in his sin. He is convicted of that, and he comes before God. We have several psalms. Psalm 51 is a great one as we see David's repentance and David's brokenness over God. But I love Psalm 32 also because it really just kind of gives us this idea of what it is to live in the forgiveness of your sins. So look at what it says. <clears throat> Psalm 32, verse 1, he says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So he talks in this few opening sentence of the joy that happens in forgiveness. The joy, he says, blessed is he said, blessed is he, right? How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. It's a, it reflects pure joy there. It talks about the amazing joy that comes with the forgiveness from God. It's interesting, that word forgiveness in the original, in the Hebrew there, uh, really could be translated taken off or taken away. That our sin is taken off of us or taken away from us. Uh, instead of being burdened by it and, 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 and burdened with it. And so therefore, because if you are forgiven in Jesus Christ, when you come to, to that place where you recognize that Jesus Christ has died for your sin, he says your sin is removed from you. It's taken away from you. It's taken off of you, and you no longer have to carry the burden of the guilt of sin. I love Psalm 103. Psalm 103, um, the author, or, or David says, the Psalm of David says in verse 10, he says, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Praise the Lord. He says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. He's removed them from us. And I know I've said this a lot, and I'm sorry, although I'm not really sorry, um, right? God knows his geography. He doesn't say he takes our sin as far as the north is from the south because you pick a spot on the earth and you go north. Eventually, you will go south. But you pick a spot on the earth and you go east and you will never go west. That's how far he removes our sins from us. That's how far he takes them away from us. How cool is that? In Jesus Christ, your sins are removed forever from you. From the burden and the guilt of that. I love what John Newton says. John Newton, we all know John Newton, right? He's the writer of the hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Later on in life at 82, when he was close to death, he said this. He said, my memory is nearly gone. He said, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. Man, I tell you what, if you're going to remember anything, remember that. You remember that because that's what it is. Um, I love it, right? He says, your sin is taken away. It's covered up. Blessed is the man who does, the Lord does not impute iniquity in, who, in whose spirit 
There is no deceit. You know, you know, honestly, he talks about sin three different ways. He says, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, and whom the Lord does not impute iniquity for that deceit where you are. Right? Praise God that he, um, he meets us in that place and he takes care of it all. And he's not trying to talk about different kinds of sin. As a matter of fact, he's not, it doesn't matter what you do. Sin is sin before God, and it offends him. All sin does. All sin offends God. All of it. Um, you say, well, but there's got to be worse sin. And, you know, listen, I don't know how hell is divided. You know, I don't really know. You know, the bad, bad people and the bad people and then the sort of bad people. They're all bad people. Right? And the reality of it is, is you're separated from God from an eternity. And there's no party in hell. People are like, yeah, I'm going to hell and I'm driving the bus. Praise God. Woo! I don't even know. Maybe they don't say praise God. I don't know. But it kills me how they are so flippant about it. What I know is there's pain and there's sorrow and there's anguish and you will never be with God. Never. But when you have sought Forgiveness through the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross? Wow. Wow. And then when you live within that, I'm going to tell you that we don't always live within it. When we live within that, there's no other comparison to it. Because in Christ, whatever happens to you, you are already mightily blessed. You are already have the blessings of God upon you because you have his forgiveness and his grace and your future is absolutely, absolutely secure. Look what he says about what it does when you don't do that. Verse 3, he said, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away, and with the fever, as with the fever heat of summer, sorry, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away, as with the fever heat of summer. Now, if you notice that there's a word there that's called selah. Selah means to pause and reflect. So David's saying, pause and reflect about the fact that. What happens when you live in the guilt of your sin? When you live in the guilt of your sin about how it wastes away, he says, my body wasted away, my groaning all day long. Day and night, your your hand was heavy upon me. Especially as a believer in Jesus Christ, do not think that you can run away from God. You can't. And so David gives this personal example of what happens to him. He says, verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. He said, therefore, let everyone who is godly pray in a time when you may be found. Surely a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. He said, I will instruct and teach you and go in the way in which I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose trappings include the bit and the bridle, to hold them in check. Otherwise, they would not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and joy and, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. It's interesting, right? He says there's this contrast that happens. In the forgiveness of your sins, there is joy, but living in the guilt of your sin is only sorrow and bondage. Living in the guilt of your sin is only sorrow and, and bondage. He gives his own personal example of how he struggled. It was at least a year or more that he was in trying to cover up his sin with Bathsheba as he, as he lived in that, making excuses, trying to say, well, I made it right, I married Bathsheba, 
Of course, you had to get her free first, so you had her husband killed, right, to make sure everything was all right, and then you, and you did it, and now the baby is sort of legitimate. You know, we try to make it right. We talk about that, right? Why don't, why don't you make it right? Wrong is wrong, period. And he said when he, when he struggled in that, he wasted away. Now, I don't, know if you've, I don't know if you've lived in the guilt of your sin where there wasn't repentance, where there wasn't, you know, where you're trying to hide it, where you're trying to make excuse for it, where you're trying to say, well, you know, I wouldn't have done it if the other person didn't do that. If they wouldn't have acted like that, then I wouldn't have acted like this. Like somehow that makes it okay. Like that makes it Okay. You know, well, if they would have just acted like this, then I would have acted like that. But because they acted like this, then I acted like that. Wait, so that makes it right? That makes it right for you to act like the fool because the other person acted like the fool. Well, God says no. And, and so what happens when we live in that and we just try to we just try to perpetuate that. We try to make excuses for that. It wastes us away. Matter of fact, I know so many people who have been in that situation who, feels like, who, who have said to me, well, I just don't feel like God's close to me. I, I can't feel God. I pray, but I don't, I don't feel like he's there. Well, I got some news for you. He's there. The issue is not him. It's you. Matter of fact, F.B. Meyer said this. He said, secret sin and inner peace with God cannot coexist. You can't live out in your sin and in the justification of your sin, trying to justify it all the time, and think that you're going to have peace with God. And think that somehow, you know, everything's going to be all right because I'm not caught. Matter of fact, he says, what you do is you live in slavery. He talks about, you know, don't be like the horse that has to be, have a bit in his mouth to be directed everywhere he goes. He's a slave in that sense. And whether you realize it or not, when you're living outside of the blessing of God's forgiveness, you are living in slavery. You are living in war like Onada did, who continued to live in that war even though they weren't at war any longer. You say, all right, well, what do I do? I, gotta, I guess I got to stop my sin. Well, <clears throat> freedom doesn't come from just stopping sin. True freedom comes in the release of your guilt and your, of your sin. F- true freedom comes when you, when you release it unto Jesus. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to believers, at least mostly here, right? Those who have come to Jesus Christ and recognized your sin, and yet how long do we hold on to that? Past God. How long do we grapple with, well, you know, I, I shouldn't have been this, and I shouldn't have been that, or I, I did this, or I didn't do that. But look what he says. He says in verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, my iniquity did, I did not hide. So I didn't try to make excuses. I stopped trying to make excuses, really was what he would say. He said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And then what does it say? And you forgave the guilt of my sin. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Some of you said, well, I, I can't, I can't. Memorize scripture. When you want a memory verse, you should memorize this. I, well, I can't. But yes, you can. You can memorize a telephone number. You can memorize this. 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? That means God doesn't play games. God doesn't play games where if you come in Jesus Christ recognizing that he died for you and you repent of your sin, God doesn't play games and say, well, I'll forgive you for a little while. Kind of like we do sometimes. He says, nope, the guilt of that will be removed from you. It's not that God says that I'll throw your sins into the sea of forgetfulness and remember them no more. That doesn't mean that God forgets your sin. He's not stupid. He doesn't have memory loss like some of us. All right? He doesn't. But he says that guilt of that sin will never come back upon you. 
It will never come back upon you for what you are. Um, now, listen, that doesn't mean, I'm, I'm not saying that you're released to just keep doing whatever you do because God's forgiven you of all your sin. And by the way, your sin is forgiven past, present, and future. There's only one sacrifice for sin. The, the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. He's only going to die once. He doesn't have to die continually. He only dies once. And it takes care of all sin for all time. And those in, who are living in faith in Jesus are free. And as he says, as Jesus said, in, or as John says in 836, he says, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. You will be free indeed. That's the real challenge. So I've got a radical challenge for you on this eve of New Year's. On this eve of the New Year's. I, I got a radical challenge for you. As David says, he says, verse 6, let everyone who is godly pray to, a, to you in a time when you may be found. Now, that doesn't mean that God is found for a little bit and not found for a little bit. But it does mean that if your heart is open to him now, do not delay. Because we have this, um, I was going to say wonderful ability. It's not really wonderful at all. We have this horrible ability to be able to tuck it back in and put it back away. But God says, don't do that. God says, don't do that. As a matter of fact, what you, what you need to do is you need to keep your eye on him. He said, because if you will seek out God when, when he may be found, when he is interacting with you, and, 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 and New Year's are a great time where you go, right, how did I do last year? Did you live up to what God wanted you to live up to? I don't care if you got a promotion. I mean, that's great. I don't care if you did something tremendous. I mean, I think that, you know, that's great. Praise God for that if God wanted that to happen. But if you, if you fought for that promotion by taking down everybody you could out of your way so that you would be the only one looked at and you won the game, what good have you done? What good have you done? And yet too often we think that the end goal is the promotion or the or the, I don't even know, right? Sometimes we get so petty, we just want to win the battle. We just want to win the, the initial battle right before us. We just want to be the right one today. What, is, what have you ever won by win, being right in the moment? Matter of fact, a lot of relationships have been burned down by, by fighting for the win in the moment. So what do I do? Well, while God may be found, you go get him. Don't push away the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Don't push away, because what we do is we get numb in that and we live in it. Listen, when it, just like when a child is chastened, they can harden in their heart. And if, they're, if they harden their heart, they'll turn away. But if their heart is soft, if their heart is soft to God, if their heart is soft to a parent, they can be molded into what God wants you to be. Just like that, you can be molded into what God wants you to be. He says, yeah, don't be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. Instead, you turn to God. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, verse 10, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness, shall surround him. Back up in verse 7, he says, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Well, but what if I don't get the promotion? You still win because you have him. You have him. God is your hiding place. And I love how personal he gets there. He's, David would say to us, listen, I've walked the road of sin, and I've lived in the guilt of my sin and the justification of my sin, trying to make it appear right to everybody else. And by the way, he was the king, so everybody would have told him, it is okay. You're okay, David. You're the king. Oh, you made it right. You married her. You did everything okay. And I love what it says I think it's 2 Samuel 11, 
But the Lord saw what David did, and he was not happy. God knows. God knows. Um, again, David would say, I've tried to justify it every way I can. It doesn't work. And I've tried to hold on to it to somehow let it do. And, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, for some of you in this room, I don't even know who you are, but for some of you in this room, you've allowed Satan to let you buy a lie that your sin from the past continues to, to make you who you are today in the sense that, that you're, you're no good, you're guilty, you're this, you're that, you're the other thing, and you're not worthy of God. The ultimate blessing in life is to live in the forgiveness of your sins. And when I say live in the forgiveness, I mean living in the joy of the forgiveness of your sins. To live in that. Well, I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, at the end of 2023, you have an opportunity before God. To say, Lord, I've been hold- if, if, if you have, I've been holding on to stuff. And, and I'm not just talking about, maybe, maybe you're holding on to resentment, maybe you're holding on to guilt, maybe you're holding on to something, and it has affected you all year. And we've tried to push it away, and we've tried to make it less than it is, and yet, if you live in the guilt of that, it will waste you away. And you get to the end of the year and you say, I'm not exactly where I want to be in you, God. And you know why? Because you've not lived in the freedom that God has for you. Paul puts it this way. He says, don't be chained anymore to sin. You are not a slave to sin any longer. It is not yours. Matter of fact, we talked about this at Christmas a week ago, that at At the cross of Jesus Christ, you became adopted into the family of God. And all your past has been wiped away. Everything is gone. All your debts have been paid. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. You are new in him. Why don't we live as new people in in him? Because Satan binds us, and we, 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 we fetter ourselves again. We shackle ourselves again to the sin of our past. And then sometimes, because of that, we go, well, I can't do anything about it, so I might as well just live into it. And then we act it out like we can help not help ourselves. Why would we do that? That is a lie of Satan. That is the lie of Satan. You say, well, but I'm not, I'm not everything that I should be. I'm not all that I, that I could be. Well, I get that. God gets that too, by the way. But praise the Lord, you are more than what you were. Again, John Newton, I love what he says, little poem. He says this. He says, I am not what I might be. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I wish to be. I am not what I hope to be. You ever, you ever live there? Go back to that. You ever live there? As a matter of fact, too many of us sometimes are just kind of stuck in that cycle. I'm, I'm, I'm not what I might be. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I wish to be. I'm not what I hope to be. I'm just not what I want to be. I'm not there. And so we live in the guilt of that, or we live, you know, we, we, we think about, and, and we have people tell us, well, you know, you must have done something in your past. That's a bunch of hogwash. You're not sick today with something because of what happened in the past. Jesus Christ, if he truly releases us, he releases it all. Well, then why am I sick? I don't know. Maybe God wants to use it for his glory. We talked about that too. Maybe God wants to use what is happening in you and through you so that he might use you as an instrument of grace to others to draw them unto himself. John Newton says, I am not what I might be. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I wish to be. I am not what I hope to be. He says, but I thank God. I am not what I once was. And I can say with the great apostle, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So let me tell you, it does start. It starts with the cross. 
And so, as we say goodbye to 2023 and we enter into this new year, where are you at? First, maybe you've been here and you've been searching out God and it all sounds good. You're just not sure if it can be true for you. I got some good news for you today. It applies to you too. And all you need to do is give up on yourself and all you need to do is accept the love and the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus Christ today. And you will be his and he will be yours. And you will be a new creation in Jesus Christ and you will be adopted into his family and you will no longer be a slave to sin and you will no longer live in the guilt of your sin. And so I invite you to consider that today, please. There's a lot of believers in this room who at some point did that and yet they picked it back up. They pick up their guilt and they pick up their sin. And listen, I'm not telling you, if you're sinning, you should repent. You should feel guilty if you are in active sin. All right, please don't hear me to say you should never feel guilty for sinning. You should absolutely feel guilty for sinning. So what do you do with that? You do exactly what you did before. You repent before God just like David, and he will forgive you of that. And he will release you from the guilt of your sin, and you can live that. And I know what you want to say, or at least I know what the temptation is because I have it. I go, well, wait a second. I, 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 I screw up. God for, I, I repent. God forgives me. I screw up. I repent. God forgives me. I screw up. I repent. God forgives me. I screw up. I repent. God forgives me. I'm saying, God, you must want to give up on me because I would give up on me. And praise the Lord, oh my goodness, God is not like a man. He does not give up on us. He does not cast us away. He does not send us off and say, I'm done with you. You, you know, you've, you've frustrated me too often. He forgives again and again. As a matter of fact, in Jesus, your forgiveness is total. And complete. And we've got to stop buying the lie of Satan. And we've got to stop living in that guilt. And we've got to stop living in, in the cycle of sin. And, and yes, sometimes I need somebody to come up to me and just say, stop. But not because stopping is going to make it better, but because I need to focus on Jesus because I'm so focused on the sin in front of me and on my guilt and on everything like that that I take Jesus out of the equation. Make Jesus everything. You focus on him. And just like that little chorus says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth, including your sin and the things that you struggle with, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Listen, remember who you are in Jesus. Remember your position before him. Again, like I said, if you need to find forgiveness, if you need to, to come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Do not delay. Do not be in a spot where you can harden your heart again. You find Jesus while he may be found. It's never too late. By the way, it's never too early either. As a matter of fact, your heart may never be as ripe as it is right now. For all of us. And so listen, I mean, you know, go ahead and have New Year's resolutions. That's okay. But you seek out God in 2024. Every day you remind yourself that if, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you remind yourself every morning that you are His. That Satan does not have a hold on you. And if you need to tell Satan that, that's fine. Just don't concentrate on him. You stand in the forgiveness and live in the forgiveness of God's grace and you walk forward in that. And when you trip and struggle and, you, and, you're, and, and get stupid and sin, because you will, you repent and you walk in the forgiveness again. And you bask in the joy of God for the joy of the Lord will what? Be our strength. The joy of the Lord will strengthen us and keep us firmly fixed on him. Let me pray. Father God, I love you. I thank you again for Jesus. I thank you for who you are. And I thank you that we can live in the joy 
of our salvation. We can live in the blessing of the forgiveness of Christ. Father, may we do that every moment of every day. Again, not giving excuses for sin, not thinking that I can do whatever I want, Lord. This is not an excuse to do whatever we want. Father, it is absolutely a focus that we would see you and that we would live in Christ and that we would make 2024 another year or the year maybe where Jesus is our everything, where Jesus is our focus, where you, it, it, that you are are everything. And so in our promotion, in our, in our marriage, in our relationships, in our jobs, in our school, in our everything that we do, Christ might be pre- preeminent, that you might be our all in all. Because, Lord, you're in every scene, and that's enough. God, I love you so much. Fill us with your spirit and fill us with your joy that we might walk in that every day to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.